This podcast is part of the 80s Ruled Network. Visit the 80s Ruled on Facebook for more 1980s awesomeness. 1980s now. Hey, welcome to a special bonus flashback episode of 1980s now. In spite of the especially deep voice, my name is Will. Uh, and uh, our show is a weekly examination of the importance of 1980s pop culture and its continued influence today. And that is true uh, even of, of an episode that I did just a short time, well, it was a while ago now, actually, with my uh, old buddy and uh, co-host, Ray, uh, back when I was, I thought I was so clever, I could name the show a combination of 80s and idiots, uh, a portmanteau, as they say, and called the show Idiots, which was a combination of letters and numbers making it virtually impossible for publicists to know how to pronounce it or listeners to find it or, or for people to ask Siri, hey, Siri, play the idiots and Siri knew what you were talking about. Uh, anyway, back then, we had, Ray and I had this really important and I think definitive discussion about which, you know, uh, controversial, let's say, uh, films from the 1980s were in fact Christmas movies. And you know the ones I'm talking about. Well, we settled it and I am confident. I'm so proud and, and uh, of this discussion and confident of the outcome that I'm willing to play play it for you right now during this week where we're off uh, for a new episode. We're back next week with, with a new episode, so give us a listen then. Anyway, without further ado, here is uh, Ray and I uh, discussing, no, n- nay, I say determining which films, I think seven, seven films from the 1980s, which of those are in fact Christmas movies. <laughs> Okay, so today on the show, we are going to be settling once and for all some of the films from the 1980s that uh, have been, I don't know, controversial as to whether or not they're considered Christmas movies. Now, I was at the, you know, before we got into the show here, I was saying we're not going to debate about Die Hard because it's definitely a Christmas movie. I could probably find, not quickly, you saying that on the show, we high-fiving, yes, yeah, I, but now <laughs> shook me up here. We have to go through the other movies before I can make an actual decision on Die Hard. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, you know what? That'll, all right. That'll be a cliffhanger for all of us, including me, because. We, yeah. We didn't talk about this beforehand, so. Yeah. I, I was, <laughs> since we've agreed on this every other time we've discussed it, um, I was going to use that as the example of, you know, uh, someone that's been resolved already. And again, it's been talked about so much, especially lately. Okay. But there's a number of other films that we're going to talk about. Uh, well, I guess we'll just mention them as we go through them. Mm-hmm. We're not going to talk about anything, obviously, that is, you know, it's not debatable. It's indisputably a Christmas film, mostly because it's got Christmas in the title, <laughs> yeah. a Christmas story, Christmas vacation, Christmas carol, uh, Santa Claus, the movie, Prancer. I mean, no one's going to debate those, right? Right. Right. We're going to have to settle on some criteria, and I've got a suggestion of some things that we can apply. All right. uh, there's some that in analyzing films, and I read a bunch of articles, including some by uh, screenwriting, uh, you know, guys like uh, Screencraft and Screenwriting Magazine, to see what they suggested makes up a holiday film. And I looked at some other criteria that even some, you know, pseudo scientists, maybe some real scientists, applied, including uh, release date. When was it released? I don't think that's a legitimate question no. because. Many of the films we're going to talk about were released in the summer, but Miracle on 34th Street was released in May. So they're released in the summer because they probably sold more tickets. Do we care what the actors or the screenwriters involved in a film think? No. I agree. Um, Do we care what the audience thinks? No. I only care what we think on this one. (laughs) Again, objective. (laughs) How about this? Do you think it can be considered a Christmas movie if you can't watch it with the whole family? Yes. To use a to use a, mod, a movie not made in the eighties, yeah, uh, Bad Santa, okay. is a Christmas movie. All right, and I would say Love Actually is a huge one, and you can't watch that with yeah. your kids. So yeah, you you can still have a Christmas movie that the kids can't watch. Yeah. You know, yeah, I agree with you because adults experience Christmas in a different way. Yeah, you know, taking it back to alcohol, and now it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> this has been <laughs> we're talking about a lot today. We could celebrate the holidays, you know, having spiked eggnog, and we wouldn't serve it to our kids, but. They would both be holiday experiences. Yep. All right. Okay. So cool. All right. So here is, uh, I'll tell you my criteria quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Is it set at Christmas time? Is it a tale of redemption? You know, usually there's the main character have a story arc that has them redeemed by the end of it. Is it a story of family? It could be blood relatives or, you know, quasi family, friends, close friends, et cetera. Yeah. And this one's going to sound a little squishy, but I think we could back it up with some stats. Is it Christmassy? And I'm talking about, does it? mention Christmas? Does it have any Christmas music in it? 
and also whether it has magic, which I'm going to put in quotes. Mm -hmm. Christmas magic is easy when you've got Santa in it, but I think some of these other films have some kind of magic in them too. Yeah. And some of them don't. All right. And I figure we'll, we'll talk about these things. We'll decide whether they're Christmas or not. And so if it's Christmas, this is what we'll decide. Hello, security. Merry Christmas. That's if it's Christmas. Right. If it's not Christmas. Get the f*** out. <laughs> and of course, both of those lines come from a movie that may or may not be a Christmas film, Trading Places. <sighs> what we'll talk about. Should we talk about that one right now? We could. Yeah, let, let's start. Let's start with it. Yeah, so Trading Places was written uh, by Timothy Harris and Herschel Weingrat and directed by John Landis, of course, came out in 1983. It was released in June of 1983. Right between Return of the Jedi and Superman 3. All right. So if we were to apply this criteria, question number one, is it set at Christmas time? Part of the movie. Sort of what? It's set between Christmas and New Year's. Climax is at New Year's. It opens somewhere after Thanksgiving and goes through New Year's. Okay. So part. For me, that works against it. Oh, so set at Christmas time. I'll say partial. Yeah. We're going to give it a partial. Is it a tale of redemption? Yeah. Right. I mean, Lewis goes from being a kind of a dick to seeing the other side of things and being more selfless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You can give it the redemption angle. And even uh, Billy. Billy's redeemed. Mm-hmm. Is it a story of family? Yeah. It's their kind of family, how they put it together, but. I, I don't think it's a family story. Oh, shoot. Because mm. Aykroyd's character falls in love, but he doesn't even fall in love with her. The prostitute played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. We don't really know if they, they're together or at the end or what. Well, the three of them are on the beach with uh, Denholm Elliott, the butler, right? Yeah, but still, we really don't know if they're all just hanging out. So it doesn't feel like a family thing to me. So I got to give it the Mm. no on that. Mm. Okay, so we got a no and a yes there. And is it Christmassy? Aykroyd as Santa Claus absolutely gets us right back into the Christmas mood. Yeah, and I would say that fits into the Christmassiness of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of Christmas imagery. Yeah, you see a lot of Christmas trees throughout the movie. I would say there's magic. This idea that a poor guy could be rich in like an instant, and a rich yeah. guy could be poor in an instant. That's magic. That's yeah. what I meant by quotes. Yeah. Uh, pork bellies making them a lot of money. That's magic. Yeah. The Dukes are kind of like, you know, evil fairy godparents, you know, who are going to, it's almost like a Clash of the Titans where the gods make a wager about the human condition. I compare them to if Scrooge had a brother. <laughs> Two brothers or one Scrooge and one is the brother. And one Scrooge and one Scrooge. They're, they're the brother mm. Scrooge. When they, like mm. when they tip the, the guy, the, the, the $5 or $10, or whatever it is. Yeah. And he says, I'll just go to the movies by myself. <laughs> then I think it's Mortimer <laughs> says half of that's from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. This one's a tough call because I wish it would have ended at Christmas instead of new year's. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Cause for me, I think the Christmas magic is, the magic that they're talking about, you know, the actual holiday. Mm. So I think once they passed Christmas, it's no longer a Christmas movie. That's interesting. It becomes a New Year's Eve thing. And then that's the yeah. climax of the film. So I'm wishy-washy on this one. I'm wishy-washy. All right. As far as mentions, I'll tell you that I did do a search of uh, Trading Places, the script, a few different versions of it as I found it, just search for the word Christmas in it. And Trading Places, they mentioned the word Christmas uh, 21 times in the film. That is not the highest among all the films we're going to look at today, but no, it is, it's it is not. I, think the, I think it's the second highest at least. But I am going to call it a Christmas movie for one reason. Oh, okay. Because we got the gift of seeing Jamie Lee Curtis's boobies in this movie. <laughs> and that, you know, <laughs> that's one of the most paused uh, <laughs> parts of the film. We should do an episode about that most paused uh, parts of these films that would definitely be up yeah. there okay so all right i think that decides it then yep it's a it's a christmas movie hello security merry christmas all right here's another one less than zero now we have these films because they appear on lists of folks saying this is a christmas movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's not that we you know just randomly picked a bunch of movies that may or may not be somebody on the internet some you know group of people think that these are christmas movies so less than zero and was released in november 6 1987 written by Harley Payton, based on a novel by Brett Easton Ellis, of course, and directed by Marek Kenevska. Sure. Set at Christmas time. It is definitely set at Christmas time. And the opening part is he comes back from college for Christmas break. Is it Christmassy? No. (laughs) Not Christmassy. Now, mentions, I will tell you that the word Christmas is mentioned 22 times, but it only features one Christmas song, Christmas in Hollis. That's it. It's all it got going for it, right? I mean, it's not a tale of redemption. No, this movie, 
I'd forgotten. I didn't like this movie. Oh my God. I hate this movie. So I watched it yeah. and I didn't like this movie. I don't think it's a Christmas movie in any way, shape or form. Yeah. I don't even think it's a good movie. So there's no way in hell I'm letting this be a Christmas movie. <laughs> well, yeah. And look, that sounds kind of subjective, but objectively, <laughs> what's it got going for it? Christmas movie. He's, he goes home. His friend, his friend's a drug addict. His girlfriend's a drug addict. His friend dies. Um, the only thing that's going for it is, is that's pretty much how an actual Christmas goes for some people. <laughs> well, okay. Yes. Yes. I'm reminded of a uh, fears Christmas song. Now. So, all right, fine. You, you want a Christmas story? Fine. That's your Christmas story is less than zero. So does Jamie Lee Curtis bear her breasts in this film? She does not, nor does the hot chick in this movie. I oh, yeah. don't remember. Jamie Gertz. All right. No Jamie Lee Curtis. So <laughs> yeah. get the f out. All right. Up next, the third movie we uh, are looking at is Gremlins. Written by Chris Columbus, of course, the great Chris Columbus, who did many more things after that as a writer-director, and directed by Joe Dante. And Joe Dante was hired by Steven Spielberg because Joe Dante directed, uh, what was that horror movie he did? Uh, the Howling. Ah, yes. Yeah, so uh, Steven Spielberg thought that he could handle the mix of comedy and horror that is at the heart of this film. Yeah. What else? It was released, another one, released in the summer, June 8th, 1984. Set at Christmas time? Absolutely. Right. I note that on Wikipedia, the first, the way they summarize the story, the first line of this is, Randall Peltzer, a struggling inventor, visits a Chinatown antique store in the hope of finding a Christmas present for his son. Yes. They open this thing with him shopping for a Christmas present. You, uh, is there a tale of redemption? This is where I get hung up. Hmm. I don't know if there's anybody redeemed in it. Maybe not redemption, but they learn, uh, this is the basic story of... A puppy is not a Christmas present. <laughs> Brought to you by PETA. <laughs> I mean, that's what it boils down to. So I'll, I'll call that a tale of redemption because mm. the, the dude comes back at the end and gets uh, yeah. Gizmo Mr. Wing. and uh, takes him away. Like, you can't have this no more because you're irresponsible. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sold as it on uh, as sold as you are because, you know, I think about like Trading Places or some of the other films we're going to talk about. It's clear that the protagonist starts off one way and ends the other way. In this film, Billy's not really changed. Phoebe Kate's character isn't changed. For me, I say uh, no on that one. Is it a story of family? I mean, it's sure. I guess there's a lot of family. It's father and son. It's yeah. There's a lot of family stuff in this. Yeah. So yeah, the whole family's involved. And you were pointing out it is Christmassy, set at Christmas time. A lot of Christmas imagery. Uh, there's Christmas decorations to this whole movie. Yeah. They go to the tree lot pretty much right away. Even to the dog being hung up in Christmas lights. Yep. There's uh, Christmas music in it. There's at least four songs. Yeah. Uh, mentions in the screenplay, 15 mentions of Christmas. There's four mentions of Santa. Most of them are during a monologue that's terribly tragic <laughs> and horrible. One that uh, Spielberg and a bunch of people wanted cut from the film, but ultimately Spielberg said, if Joe Dante wants it, it's a Joe Dante film. I hired him to be Joe Dante. To Spielberg's credit, it made it in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, this is one where I went in believing it was a Christmas film, and then as I started thinking about it, I guess more objectively, I don't know. I feel less settled that it is. Well, part of my criteria is while yeah. I'm watching it, do I yeah. lose the fact that it's a Christmas movie at any point during the film? Hmm. This one, absolutely. I remembered we were uh, at Christmas time and it was a Christmas movie the entire hmm. time I was watching it. So I have to go with yes. Yeah, for me, I agree with you image wise, but I don't have that warm, fuzzy feeling that some of these other films that wouldn't even strike folks as Christmas, I still have anyway, even when I, you know, in spite of that. And it's not the horror in this because I think you could have action and blood. You know, we're yeah. going to talk about Die Hard later and still have that Christmas spirit. Well, let, me, let me try and uh, persuade you to my way of thinking, okay? Okay. Yep. Since the entire movie takes place during the Christmas season, mm -hmm. you never go more than, I think it's five minutes without a Christmas reference. Okay. Even the gremlins yes. at one point are wearing Christmas hats yes. and doing carols. Gizmo's adorable with his little hat on. I think they did a great job of incorporating Christmas into this movie. And, and it, it doesn't ever leave your mind that it's a Christmas movie. All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you one, about one that's not on the list then to see if I could challenge this the way you're thinking about this. What about Silent Night, Deadly Night? Christmas movie. <laughs> well, then, look, I, again, I... I don't know that a horror movie can't be a Christmas uh, movie. That takes but, place at Christmas and Santa no. is the killer. Yeah. So it's a Christmas film. But you're just settling on imagery. Well, my criteria is different. Mm -hmm. My main criteria is 
as I'm watching the film, do I forget it's supposed to be a Christmas movie? Hmm. And there's a movie we're going to talk about that does by far the greatest yeah. job of sticking in to a movie. <laughs> but this one definitely right. does a good job. So, All right. And I'm not sold. All right. So here we All go. Right. Here's, this could be the middle Just, tier when we don't agree. <laughs> Merry New Year! <laughs> because it's, it's not quite Christmas, yeah. but it's almost. All right. So we didn't agree on that one. All right. So, okay. What's next? What was that? Rocky IV? Uh, uh, what'd you find on this one, buddy? Uh, released in 1985. This one was the one that was released as closest to Christmas time. Released November 27th. Written and directed by Sylvester Stallone, of course. All right, let's just go through the thing here. Is it set at Christmas time? Barely. I guess we can toss out, is it Christmassy even among that? Because there's only one Christmas song. There's only one, there's only three mentions of Christmas. I will tell you this. Yeah. Christmas does not come up until 36 minutes into this movie. Well, you say that, but... There's other films, classic films. Look, I don't think this is a Christmas movie, but I learned in this research that films like uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which most people regard as a Christmas film, barely talks about Christmas. And this whole idea of whether or not, you know, he should commit suicide, it has a suicide in it. Well, that's very Christmassy. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, like uh, well, like Christmas with uh, the Satan, <laughs> that uh, James Chant <laughs> yeah. song. But but they, they don't really get to Christmas till the very end of the film. Yeah, once again, they mention Christmas, then he goes to Russia and I watch him yeah. run around in the snow with a log on his back while- <laughs> It was a Christmas tree. <laughs> while Drago's shooting up dope so he can whoop his ass. <laughs> and then they fight. There's no more mentions of Christmas no. until the very end when he's like, hey, uh, have Merry Christmas to my kid. I'm like, Is what? that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, you can't have a movie and call it a Christmas movie- if at the beginning, you don't even know it's a Christmas movie. And again, the filmmakers aren't calling it a Christmas movie, but somebody, somebody some did. movement on the internet, they did. I'm not yeah. saying this is a bad oh, yeah. movie. This is a great yeah. movie. I think uh, Stallone did a great job yeah. writing this yeah. thing. I think the only yes it could get on our checklist is, is it a tale of redemption? Because every Rocky story is some kind of, he starts somewhere low and he gets somewhere higher. Yeah, This is more a tale of revenge also. Because mm. Apollo just wants to go in there and spar with right. Drago to help his career, and Drago kills him. Yeah. So Rocky's like, "Screw this guy! I'm gonna go. In, I'm going to Russia. I'm gonna beat him in Russia, just uh, because I want to." Yeah. So I don't know if it's redemption. It's more of cold blooded revenge. Yeah, you're right. Even there, it's kind of weak. All right, that's an easy one then. Yeah. Get the f out. All right, number five. We're just sailing along now. We're settling things, folks. Mm -hmm. We'll have a definitive list here. Number five is Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters 2, rather, which came out in 1989, written, of course, by Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, and directed by Ivan Reitman. This, again, was released June 16th, set at Christmas time. I'm going to have to say this is not set in Christmas time. I, yeah. do, I do understand. All right, they show some Santa Claus sh at the beginning, like T-shirts and crap for sale. Yep. And at one point, the Ghostbusters are wearing Santa Claus hats. Mm -hmm. There's no snow on the ground in New York yeah. City. There's, most often, there's snow at that time of year. It is a tale of redemption, right? The Ghostbusters are kind of seen as a joke, and they wind up saving the town again. It's basically a remake of the first film, isn't it? I mean, Not really, because it's... it's yeah, <laughs> I like this movie. I know Bill Murray hates this thing, but I think it's a yeah. good movie. I just, I just don't find enough Christmas magic. Well, I would say the Christmas magic in this one might be bringing the Statue of Liberty alive, yeah. but I agree with you. Everything else falls apart. It just doesn't feel like a Christmas movie to me. Well, there's only two mentions of Christmas in the film. They mention New Year's nine times. Because that's the end of the world. Yeah. So that's a, bit, a pivotal plot point. You know, to your earlier point, uh, when you were talking about, uh, what was it? Uh, trading Places. Trading Places. Mm -hmm. This ends on New Year's and Trading Places also has a climax on New Year's. But unlike Trading Places, you know what we don't get to see in Ghostbusters 2? What's that? Jamie Lee Curtis's boobs. <laughs> that that pulled it out. That's the gift. That's the Christmas yeah, magic. There's also no Christmas songs. Mm -mm. Uh, the only thing that's remotely a holiday song is Old Lang Syne, which, you know, the New Yorkers all come together to sing at the end. Isn't that more of a New Year's Eve song, though? Yeah, exa yeah, exactly, yeah. I was saying if it's, if it's holiday at all, it's New Year's Eve. I'm saying, yeah. Right. All right, so that's a, hmm, that was an easy one. Yeah. Get the f out! All right, Billy Ray says, get out. 
We are sailing along here. Well, this is another Christmas episode, so Mm -hmm. we want to make sure we give the people something they can enjoy with the family on Christmas. Tales of marijuana and boobs are always fun to listen to with the family. That's not advice. We're not giving out advice this episode. This sounds like... You know, I don't, I'm don't. i not giving advice out ever. So he also wasn't giving advice earlier when he was saying to take a coffee mug. Oh, no, no. That was true. An idiot. No, no, no. Oh, that, is, okay. that is good, solid advice if you want to drink it. Work. All right. So sometimes he gives out advice. All right. Number six. All right. Number now we're getting six. to the meaty good stuff here. Real talk. Mm-hmm. Lethal Weapon. Released March 6th, 1987. Again, past Christmas time. It's getting closer to springtime. Of course, it was written by Shane Black, who also wrote in the 1980s, wrote Predator. He also appears in The Predator. He's killed unceremoniously by The Predator. He's also written and directed a number of movies since. And he wrote and directed the most recent Predator's reincarnation, which was not good. Uh, And directed by Richard Donner, we talked about on the last episode. Set at Christmas time? Hell yeah, it is. The opening scene, you have Jingle Bell Rock. Mm -hmm. You have the lights on the balcony. Yeah. And of course, the magical gift of boobies. (laughs) Oh, what is our criteria devolving into? Yes. And now you just remember you think of something else we said earlier. We also get a suicide. And a suicide. (laughs) But it's not. (laughs) It's not a suicide. It's a murder. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, Just to make it clear, we're not making light of Mm -hmm. self-harm. We're making... Fun of the fact that these dark moments appear in what may be a Christmas film. Holidays are hard uh, for some folks. And if you need help, you reach out. Please find somebody to talk to about it. Right. Right. Okay. So murder. It is. I just watched. I just watched it. She's not tossed out the window. No, but she's doped up or whatever. She took pills that had Drano put in them. By the mm-hmm. other prostitute, because the, the the boss told her to do it. So, so she would have been dead anyway? Or you think she died while standing on the edge of that balcony? She would have been dead anyways. Oh, okay. See, you should have rewatched this one, because this is actually- well, I know, I know that scene. excellent movie. I know that scene. She takes the drugs, she climbs on the edge of the balcony, and then she plummets to her death. Yes. I was thinking, if she OD'd at all, she OD'd on a Ford. Could have been. It looked like a suicide to me. Yeah, but when they did the toxicology report- yeah. She'd been murdered. Mm. See, I didn't, I didn't catch that. I thought it was just the guy was pissed off because his daughter was given drugs and she OD'd. No, they killed her to shut him up because he was saying uh-huh. he didn't want to do it no more. Mm. All right, I got you. Because if you remember, when they get to the scene where he's telling- uh, Yeah, they're in his office. They're in his office and he's talking to Murtaugh yep. and he's drinking eggnog, by the way. Mm. Um, he goes, you know, I have another daughter I have to protect. Yeah. And they already killed one of them, so- Right. And then he gets killed. But, you know, once again, that subtle Christmas magic, the eggnog. Mm. He's drinking the party (laughs) nog, man. I think you're stretching our analysis here. Once again, let me give you some more facts about Lethal Weapon here, buddy. Okay. All right. You don't need any criteria for this movie because. All right. Murtaugh's house is a plastic Santa on the top. Yes. That Riggs is watching Looney Tunes, the Christmas special. Yeah. And he almost commits suicide. Oh, boy. I did not expect this was going to be a running theme of our Christmas yeah. films. The cops sing Christmas carols at the station. Mm-hmm. Um, Dixie, the prostitute that they go to visit that the house explodes. Yeah. Snowman on top of her roof. Right. They must say Merry Christmas. I'm going to guess 40 times in this movie. What do you got? This one, they mentioned the word Christmas 24 times. This yeah. is the most uh, mentions in all the films that we took a look at. And like you said, there's they, they, there are Christmas songs, including three, at least three. And... They cast Darlene Love, who, who sings sings one of the most iconic Christmas songs from the 19, I want to say 60s. It's uh, Baby, Please Come Home, mm-hmm. as Murtaugh's wife. They have all these little subtle Christmas mm-hmm. things that they run through this entire movie. Yep. And the big one that you like is the family. Yep. It definitely checks off redemption for Riggs. Yeah. And it, it ends with them having Christmas dinner together, mm-hmm. and I'll Be Home for Christmas is playing as this movie ends. Wow. You know, I was on the fence about this one, but I am firmly on the other, on one side of the fence that's the decorated with Christmas lights. This movie is so well done as a Christmas movie yep. because they don't have snow. So they mm-hmm. did a great job of slipping in those little subtle things to yep. just keep reminding you. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking how like this one in Die Hard, which are set, pl- which uh, take place in California, it's hard to pull off reminding folks that it's Christmas to, to us, at least because we're, you know, from an area where it snows during the wintertime. Yeah. Um, so trading places in New York, Gremlins is a lot of snow. It's tricky, like you're saying, but they, they do get it out there that it's Christmas. Yeah. This one's definitely a Christmas movie for me. I'm sold. 
Hello, security. Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, that's the official list. So what do we got here now? Let's see. We got um, trading places. We said yes, but it was only saved by uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, I think. I, I think it mm -hmm. is, is a Christmas movie otherwise, it's too. Still bo it, it was already teetering. That just pushed it over the edge. You say teetering. I you can't think. I keep thinking of that scene now. <laughs> I don't know why the word teetering is reminding me of that. All right, so, so yeah. So trading places is one. Uh, we said less than zero. Absolutely not. Yeah, that one. If you know how they put movies in that Library of Congress, yeah, this one should be put in the trash and never seen again. <laughs> Could it be put in the trash at the Library of Congress at least? Yes. I mean, and I want the actors to be there. Like they think it's going right. into the library, and they just throw it in the right. garbage can. <laughs> I think we had a split decision on Gremlins. Yes. Right? You said yes. I said no. Rocky, we both agreed no. Mm -hmm. Ghostbusters, we both agreed no. Mm -hmm. And then Lethal Weapon, you convinced me. Again, I wasn't sure, but I think that's firmly a yes now. If you rewatch that, you would definitely catch all the little subtle things. that Because I was watching it for Christmas reasons. Yeah. So when I normally watch it, I don't look for those things. Yep. But this time I was paying attention and I caught all of them. I'm like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. Even the bad guys are telling each other Merry Christmas. Yeah. So for me, this one ranks really high on the Christmas scale. All right. So we got two definitive yeses, three definitive noes, and one split decision. And that's our official list. But now, wow, this is, again, this is a cliffhanger for me because yeah. now based on everything I've learned from you and mm -hmm. your analysis, I cannot see how you will come down on the Die Hard is not a Christmas movie camp. I think you've now boxed yourself into a corner with some of your other rules. Well, and now here's the problem for me with Die Hard. Uh, like I said before, for me, I watch the movie and it has to feel, they have to remind me it's a Christmas movie. Well, okay. So we start off really good. We're at, yeah. It's Christmas Eve. We got a present. We're going mm -hmm. to a party. Right. We're doing great. We're, we're, we're on the train. We're on our way to... to Santa Claus, you know. North Pole. Yeah, we're, we're on the Bipolar Express on our way to <laughs> Christmas. So, and then the bad guys show up and I'm like, oh, cool. So then we get, uh, we start rolling and you start to forget. But then they bring in the, I've got a machine gun, ho, ho, ho scene. Christmas hat on that guy too. Right. So now, okay, all right. It's, all right, we're, we're on a Christmas movie again. But then they really, for me, they start to trail off at that point, man. There's not a lot more Christmas references after well, that. Well, I mean, the entire party is set and the entire event is set on Christmas Eve. Yeah, but so... So to your earlier point about you would lo love if trading places ended on Christmas Eve, this one begins and ends on Christmas Eve. Yeah, but Less Than Zero was at Christmas time, and that didn't save that movie. Yeah, but Christmas time. This one's also got five Christmas songs. It mentions Christmas 18 times. I did, yes. Um, I, I, th I just think a lot of the Christmas references were up front, like Christmas and Hollis with Argyle mm -hmm. on the limo. Well, we've got John McClane whistling Jingle Bells at some point. Yeah. I mean, they sprinkle it in. Ode to Joy, you know, which is that classical music piece that they use many times, including when they finally open the vault, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. just shortly before their yes. Hans is saying Christmas is the time for miracles. Yeah. You know, Ode to Joy is not an officially a Christmas song, but it's been thought of as a Christmas song since the 1940s. Pretty much, yeah. So I don't, I disagree with you. I think, and that's what three quarters of the way into the film or the, maybe two thirds. The biggest problem I have is I think because I watched Lethal Weapon and then yeah. I watched Die Hard. Okay. I think that really threw a loop-de-loop -loop in this for me because I really was like, man, I wish Die Hard would have ended with like Christmas dinner or him seeing his kids and giving them the gifts. Well, wait a second though. Of course it doesn't do that because his kids aren't there, but we do have that redemption with his wife. And that represents all that. Because if you remember at the beginning, the mother saying, are we going to see dad on Christmas Eve? And she says, I'm working with, working it out with Santa. Yeah. And then he gets the I teddy just, bear for the kid. He finally meets up with the wife. At the I end. just really wish we would have had the fade out and then them mm -hmm. at the house. Yeah. I think for filmmaking, you, that would have been clunky. Lethal Weapon pulled it yeah, off. That's true. He shows up, the redemption story, yep. he gives the bullet, yep. and then he comes running off to get him to bring him back, mm -hmm. and the lights, and all that, and that's Christmas. So for me, I, the ending, man, really pulled me away from the Christmas part of this. See, for me, him meeting his wife, him hugging and kissing his wife, that's everything you just said you wanted, that is represented in that moment. Him hugging Al yeah. and Al having his own redemption arc where he's able to pull the gun out again and, you know, and fight bad guys. Doesn't have to maybe be, uh, you know, a beat cop or a desk jockey or whatever he is. All right. The problem I have is, is that could be a Thursday in July. 
Mm, they could have overtaken the tower in July on a Thursday and the exact same thing would have happened at the end. So I'm torn on this one because it does start right. off with a lot of Christmas yep. stuff. But I think they waned off in the second half of the movie. You know, I, I heard somebody, this has been going around Twitter like crazy now. Some little kid self-owned himself with his parents because he was trying to argue that Die Hard is not a Christmas movie by saying, it's not a Christmas movie if you take Christmas out and it doesn't affect the plot. And then they said to him, well, he only goes home because it's Christmas Eve. It's during a Christmas party. The terrorists say, let's rob the building now because there's less uh, security on Christmas. All these things. And then the kid was like, oh crap, I guess you're right. It is a Christmas movie. I, I, that rule, I think you can, like, can't you go to Lethal Weapon and say, well, they could set it in the summertime and it would still be an effective story about a guy who's fighting, you know, these bad guys and ultimately decides to not kill himself. It just seems, I don't know if you can really apply that to movies because it's just, you're, you'd be rewriting every film and then you're analyzing a different film and not the one we have. Well, I guess what it boils down to is it did take place at Christmas. Yep. It does have redemption. It does have family. Yep. And it does, for me, have just enough Christmas. Mm. Oh, I, oh. I'm still going to classify it as a Christmas movie. Yes! <laughs> it's Christmas, Theo. It's the time of miracles. <laughs> there you go. It was, wow, that was a nail bite. It was so close, but yeah, it's still... A, and I, I think, had I not watched Lethal Weapon right before Die yeah. Hard, this would not have yeah. been as hard a decision. Yeah. Die Hard remains a Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah, you know, hey, you flopped, a, you know, you were a little bit on, you came over to the one side on Die Hard, I came over to the one side on, on Lethal Weapon. It's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> it is. So we have definitively proved whether or not certain films from the 1980s are Christmas movies. And these are films, again, that folks on the internet were suggesting that, you know, for us were questionable. Well, you do know I'm objective on these things, Well, I do know that. But have we proven anything? We have proven yes. beyond a shadow of a doubt wow. that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. <laughs> and there you have it. Look, we even proved something which is uh, how we concluded every episode back then. Hey, uh, we're back next week with a new episode. Please come back and listen to us then. In the meantime, if you want to help support the show, share an episode on Facebook. Tell your friends, tell your family. Seriously, this is really helpful to us. Okay, hey, uh, we will talk to you again next time on 1980s Now. <laughs>